with, with the parts lens I'm, I'm using now to sort of see things in a slightly different perspective. Um, it's not trait, it's not type. Parts, maybe a bit of the others as well. So a little bit about me, my type preferences are INTJ. And originally I'm from Newcastle, but now I'm living down in Brighton with my family. Um, in terms of, uh, hello, there's one of them there. <laughs> hello. So in terms of uh, what I've studied, so I did my MSc in organisational psychology. I uh, studied a, a diploma in coaching as well. But before that, I was actually uh, did first degree in chemistry. And then I got into music for about 15 years. So I've had quite a diverse background. I got really into Jung and Thai and all that kind of thing. In the same way I threw my passion into music, I threw it into psychology and Jung and, and all the things I'm going to be talking about with you today. I'm current BAPT treasurer and I'll be talking at the AGM later, uh, telling you how well we're doing financially. Um, or not, so you have to turn up and sign up. Um, Personalityparts.com is my, one of my websites and that's where I've currently got uh, workshops and so on to do with the personality part system that I'm running in London and Brighton at the minute. I also run a Brighton Jungian psychology meetup for people who are interested in the area, and that's actually doing really well. I'm in quite a slightly alternative minded area of the country as well, and we've got a lot of therapists and people living there interested in that kind of thing. Um, so, I'm going to talk about the unconscious and what it is. It's a very mysterious topic. I'm trying to simplify it, make it more <coughs> down to earth. Here's a bit of Carl Jung. Uh, the superior function is always the expression of the conscious personality, its aim, its will, and its achievement. While the inferior functions, and, and remember, he didn't just see the fourth function, as we sometimes call it, as the inferior function. He saw the other functions as well as the inferior functions, besides the, the, the dominant. Um, whilst the inferior functions belong to the things that happen to one or happen to you, um, the idea that you know, we've got some sort of intent or control or executive will with the conscious personality, but yet there's something I like to call it the mind has a mind of its own. The, the unconscious is, is the mind's processes expressing themselves, doing their thing, and they happen to you. You don't decide. It's like, almost like when you consciously take your eye off the ball then there's the unconscious kind of just steps in and, and runs the show. We often think about the grip experience. We often talk about that as a stress response. But there's more than just one grip. There's, there's a lot of gripping going on. And actually, in our daily lives, we spend a lot more than time than we think with our mind wandering and taking us to places and, and just functions, processes expressing themselves, things happening, which we're not sitting there making a conscious decision about. We're not deliberating about going, oh, what am I going to think about next? It's more like you just kind of go with it and it happens. And actually that, I think, is partly of what our type is. It's, it's the fact that, well, where is that mind taking us? Why does it take us one way versus another? That's kind of the basis of, of where we naturally fall, where we, where we go to automatically. Um, on no account should we imagine that the unconscious lies permanently buried. It's the idea that some people think, oh, that's such a mysterious idea. Where is it? Oh, we might as well not even think about it because it's kind of, we can't know about it because it's unconscious. But it, it's not, it's actually right there under our nose all the time in our daily lives. It, there's a constant influx of the unconscious. The observer can decide only with difficulty which characteristics or character traits are to be ascribed to the conscious and which the unconscious personality. So if you're watching someone's external behavior, it's kind of a, a um, a thing to pick apart. Well, what, what, is, what is it that they're deciding to deliberately, executively to, to do with their behavior? And, and well, what is just happening? What is unconsciously emerging? Um, and, and Jung was right about generally two different main aspects of the unconscious, the collective unconscious. Um, this is a quote from Jung here. The, collect, the unconscious regarded as the historical background of the psyche contains in a concentrated form the entire succession of imprints which from time immemorial have determined the psychic structure as it now exists. And that's the kind of key to this, the psychic structure. What is the structure of systems of the mind? We're talking about the mind here, not the brain, although the two are going to be related in some way. 
can see, he was into the, the structure and dynamics of the psyche, of the entire mental, psychological system. And so he saw his collective unconscious as the contribution of something evolved, something shared, something collective, that's what it means, something that we all have, in the same way that physically we have a collective physical structure. We may all vary in detail, but we've all basically got the same form, i.e. you could say people have four limbs, generally speaking, they have the same set of organs and two eyes and, and a brain, and, and, and even the brain has the same kind of general form. But yet there's very, with variation within that, individuality. And yet the collective, it, psychologically speaking, is that we've got the same kind of system, the same set of processes, and, and it's the, the general overview of it is the same. Um, and therefore the same, so these, you get these general patterns of behavior, these, these ways of being, um, which we all share in some way. Um, they present themselves as mythological themes and images. And he saw the idea that um, what previous cultures often talk about as gods, like polytheistic cultures with multiple gods, mythological stories, they're not just random things that were made up, they're, they're essentially projections of our internal mental makeup and processes, but projected as if they were external. They're clues as to who we are as people, these stories. And people now use the word myth as if it's some kind of insult. You know, dispelling myths, myth busting. Or that's like, myths are rubbish, there's nothing to myth. No, there's loads to myth. Myths, you know, Jung saw that myths are actually telling the story of the things that we otherwise cannot see about who we are as human beings and our nature. So, the strikingly similar among all races, that's collective part. You know, it doesn't matter where you're from in the world, it doesn't matter what time you're from, that these, these structures, in a, at least in an overview way, are there within the mind. And that leads us to archetypes, the archetypes of the collective unconscious. Uh, you know, there's two kind of roots you could say to that, you know, archaic, like archaeology, something that's from, stemmed from the past, but over all time, archetypes are there within all different eons. You know, so the, the, the stories, the, the characters that people project about these archetypes might vary in their detail depending on time and what's, what cultural information they can find with that and use it to tell the story, but the theme is still the same. And it's typical, found everywhere. So archetypes, again, they're, they're not just something that one country, people from one area of the world have, but you see, you found that, you know, you would find that people would, would have similar themes and, and things happening in their dreams, no matter where they're from, for instance. These same kind of themes are there, the archetypes. And um, I like to you know, look at it as an inherited, archetypes as inherited or evolved, shared, i.e. collective ways of being. They're like abstract blueprints. Remember that it's about the essence, the theme of what, what's happening. And, that, uh, and it's digging into the theme versus the, the multiple different ways that theme can express itself in a, in a concrete way in actual life. So that's the hard thing about first about noticing archetypes. You're looking at a level of abstraction. You've got to look at the behavior, the detail, but actually kind of look behind that. And I'm talking as an introvert, intuitive. It's easy for me to do that. For some people, it's a little bit more difficult to peer behind the obvious and to see, well, what is the theme? What is the essence? What is the, the thing that's going on underneath it? Um, in depth typology, which we'll talk about in a sec, is, um, I, I like to think about the function, i.e., you know, the, the functions we talk about in type, the sensing, intuition, think, feeling, they're what we do. Function is what we do, it's something functional. Um, and an archetype is the way that we do it. It's something about the way of relating that is archetypal. Whereas the function gives us gives it a, a process, a, a thing, a, something that it's trying to do. Um, it can also look at archetypes as roles, characters, emotional tones, flavours, qualities of expression. Give you some idea of what you know what you're looking for when you're watching people's behavior, you're looking for these archetypes coming up. That's the way it comes out. Um, and there's the personal unconscious. Now, that's Freud. Freud's doing a good impression of Jeremy Corbyn there. You know, he's familiar, but it's kind of odd what's going on there. Um, contents, it's personal unconscious, like. 
it's similar to Freud, and Freud and Jung knew each other, and they worked together, and he learned from Freud, and then he went off, and this is one of the areas where they departed in their way of looking at psychology, was that like Freud had this, what Jung would call the personal unconscious, Freud would just call the unconscious. Um, the idea that this content, which were conscious, which we were party to, but then they'd become repressed somehow, they'd been forgotten or repressed, um, much as you do when you're a baby. Um, you know, there's so much you see in the world, but actually, this, it's there somewhere, but you can't access it later on in life, um, in a direct way. Um, so this idea of the personal unconscious, you know, it's actually the, the, the real lived experience of life, the details, the concrete stuff, whereas the, the collective unconscious is more this abstract form that shapes things, that gives it an essence, it gives it a character. Whereas the personal unconscious is more the actual material of life that we experience. Um, and this is the idea of where the, I think complexes comes in. The complex is like where the archetype, the collective, meets the personal, meets the actual material of life. So for instance, a parent archetype, a uh, mother or father archetype, is like a general way of being parent-like. It's a sort of relational essence of dynamic. And you could say, well, what is it to be a parent? What is the dynamic between parent and child? There's something about that relationship which you can describe as a quality. And that's the archetypal side of it. And then the, com the complex comes in with the personal meshes with it. And then you've got your actual experience of real, your real parents and other parents and everything that is parent material that draws together the archetype and fleshes it, clothes it. The idea that archetypes clothe themselves in facts. They flesh themselves out. The abstract form fleshes itself out with something which is real. So, you know, that my general way of relating as a parent might then become shaped with actual material that's actually become absorbed from my real experience with my own parents. And there's different theories in ways of looking at the mind that take different extremes in nature versus nurture we're kind of talking about here. Some, a lot of ways of, of uh, for instance, transactional analysis takes more of this sort of um, concrete way, the idea that what we like as a parent is almost entirely shaped and absorbed from experience with, with real parent figures. But I'm saying you know, there's something in essence there in all of us which has evolved in us, which is that archetype, which is that essence of being that way, which then meets the personal, which meets the experience of the concrete, and then that shapes, that creates a complex, which then becomes a part of us. And John Beebe, um, Jungian analyst, so he's a fantastic guy, so you've might heard him about a bit in this conference already, because he's He's a Jungian analyst, he's, he's an analytical psychologist, he's, he's into the depth psychology, he's into looking at the unconscious mind, and he's, the, the training to be a Jungian analyst is, is very in-depth and long, and, and, and it requires a lot of personal work as well. It's not the faint hearted. And he's created, quite uniquely in his fields, a lot of analysts don't use type, there's only a smaller number of the proportion of them that do, but he's taken it and made it into something of his own developed a system where he's incorporated the depth of Jungian analysis in a sense with, uh, with the type system that we're familiar with and extended it and he's, a lot of it's written in his book Energies and Patterns and Psychological Types. Um, I said he works in San Francisco and then what he, some people refer to what he created as the eight function eight archetype model. He's taken all eight of Jung's function attitudes as something that's called the cognitive processes and he's, he's said that well, in certain, in each particular type, they express with a different arch archetypal energy, as you might call it, or character in a certain predictable way. But he, it's, this almost seemed too good to be true to him at first when he figured this out. And he was like, he, you know, he kind of watched people in his practice. He spent day in, day out talking to people about their experience of being themselves, of who they are, what's their, what is their experience of being a human being. And through that, he, you know, he kind of figured out with his knowledge of type that there was a pattern going on there, but he didn't quite trust it at first. He spent 30 years like, trying to validate it in his clinical practice. There was workshops in America that happened. With, uh, I don't know if anyone's been on those. Yeah, a number of people here have, um, with the help of Bob McAlpin, who is a fantastic guy in this field as well. So it became called depth typology as well through the work of uh, Mark Hunziker, who wrote another book at the same similar sort of time in, a few years ago. Um, BB, I agree with him, you know, he's partly in the sense that he sees these function attitudes, the eight functions, as types of consciousness. You could call them types of mental process, if you're not 
think of conscious unconscious as being different. They're potentially conscious, potentially unconscious. They're all mental processes. Um, so Mark Jung's um, Babies model looks somewhat like this. So this is just a couple of types, my type preferences and an ESFP an example. So you can show, see that um, the archetypal, you could call them slots, uh, are there, and then the functions, depending on your type, are going in a different order, but it's quite a predictable thing. You can learn quite simply how the order looks, there's a logic to it. Um, you may recognize the first four from, it's from type dynamics, which is more widely shown. This refers to the top four without the shadow. And the shadow side is, is kind of one of Phoebe's greatest um, additions to this system. But it's difficult because this, this looks like a hierarchy. People can't think, help thinking of top to bottom means bigger to smaller, means better to worse. There's something like hierarchical about the way it looks and it inherently can't, people can't get their heads out of that. It's not a hierarchy. These in Phoebe's model are qualitative slots. That's the same, what his model says is that, not that these are inherently more accessible or more conscious or more developed than these ones in, in, in a predictable order. You can obviously you can say some general things about the, the dominant function because we're all aware that you know there's something special about the dominant function, but it's it's qualitative, not quantitative. There's no hierarchy directly that you can read into this, um, which is why he likes to draw it out like this, a spine, what we call the spine and arms model. I think that's better because it doesn't imply that kind of way of thinking about it, but it does show the oppositional effect. What we're showing, if you, if you follow the numbers, the numbers would be where the, the functions slot in. So the idea of having, you know, the, the, when the functions slot in, you do get the oppositional effect. So, for instance, with my type, you get introverted intuition and extroverted sensing in the way that they form oppositional pairs of function attitudes. Uh, and it's just nice to see that and how they oppose each other. Um, so... I came to, to, to develop this into a different way of looking at it as a part system. So where Phoebe sort of saw it as an extension to type theory, as it kind of existed already, I'm trying to just think about the whole thing from a completely different perspective and see it from the ground, from the start, as a parts model, which is already in there anyway, if you actually read what's, what people have written. Like, uh, BB himself saying, I, I re regard them as arch archetypal complexes carrying the different functions. And I like to speak of them as typical subpersonalities found in all of us. So BB was already like explicitly writing that, that he saw these archetypal parts as subpersonalities. And there's many people who've written about and many systems that already use a parts or a subpersonalities model. There's a great book, in, and without going into too much detail, uh, John Rowan, who's a British transpersonal psychologist, he wrote a book called Subpersonalities in 1990, and that gives a great overview of all the systems that were using subpersonalities to that point. There's a great reference if you want to read about all the different uh, systems, names, ways of conceptualizing it. He, sees, um, he describes it as a semi-permanent and semi-autonomous region of the personality capable of acting as a person. Of many selves. Um, this ego states, internal objects, self schemas, like he lists literally, I don't know, at least 50 different names which over time people have referred to essentially the same thing. And when you talk to many people, most people in everyday life, they're aware of this reality of themselves that they are not, they're, they're not the same over time in every moment. And in fact, they're, they're quite distinctly different. People. The more you, closer you get to know people, like we know our partners, like we know our family, we get to see all these different sides, and they become familiar, and they just keep reoccurring. You know, they're not just transient states that appear once in your life and they're gone. You know, they keep coming up. These subpersonalities they form a regular occurrence to those who, in those who, who we know well, and they do have a very different character. They almost seem, and they can click, clash, and conflict, not just with you, but parts of not with parts of other people, but also with, with other parts of yourself. Um, you know, that's the idea that they kind of have a boundary, so they are a part. There can be an internal conflict between two of these different characters, so there's some kind of boundary between them, there's some separation, therefore, parts. Jung himself wrote about, so if you look in the back of um, Psychological Types, and this is a reference from 
um, the H.G. Baines translation, which is not collected works versions, it's, it's a page number, not a paragraph. But he's writing about the anima, and he is saying that um, it's a function complex that's best characterized as a personality. Observation can succeed without much difficulty in proving at least the traces of character splitting in the normal individual. Angel abroad and devil at home is a formulation of the phenomenon of character splitting derived from everyday experience. That's a direct quote from Jung. So Jung himself saw things in a parts way, He's in a way of, of having subpersonalities. And he saw the anima as one of those, anima being the, the function, um, the archetype that, car that carries our inferior function <coughs> in the Jesus model. So it's not a new way of looking at things. It's always been there, actually explicitly been there, but people don't talk about it. There's actually a bit of resistance to some degree to people talking about parts of the self because it's a bit pathological in, in terms of stigma, in terms of everyday culture. Now, where a lot of people in psychology will, will come across it is through things like uh, dissociative identity disorder, i.e. multiple personality disorder. You know, to have multiple personalities is somehow a disorder. Well, there's a, obviously we've got this, the mind as a system and, and mental illness is usually just an extreme of some kind of normal, fun, typical functioning. And, you know, absolutely, you know, there's this, 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 this times when people's parts of themselves become completely disconnected. At least in a normal, typical individual, there's some kind of family relationship between them in the sense that there's a communication, that there's a sense of integration, and they all do flow into some sort of sense of identity. Yes, at times, some of them pop out more than others and take over and run the show for a while, but there's some kind of return to, to a more integrated self. Um, but yet, they're there in all of us. So, like I said, well, whereas what's new about personality parts? So people could say, oh, well, it's just like, well, you're just taking Levy's theory and his ideas and, and just giving it a different name. Well, I'm, I'm not, because I'm trying to give it something that you know, I'm creating which is more unique to the way I'm seeing things. And, and I'm adding, as, we go, as I go, as I'm learning and developing it, and adding different ideas to this. So, like I said, type depth typology, it builds an extension to type theory. You kind of need type and then you need to have the extension to, to build on it. Personality parts, what I'm aiming to do is create a parts model of the mind from the ground up, something that I can introduce people to who may have never done any self-work, anything to do with psychology or <laughs> personality, and give them a working model of understanding their reality through a model of the mind and parts, which will also reference modern psychology, because the problem we've got with type is that it's, it's kind of got caught in a, in a stream that becomes separate to the rest of psychology. And that's no wonder you get resistance and people attacking type. Because it's, no one's made much effort to really reintegrate everything that's happened in the last hundred years. Since Jung wrote about type, there's been these completely two different worlds. And the, more, the further we go through time, the more distant they become. But psychology in the last hundred years has had a hell of a lot to say about the mind and human experience. And, um, it, it's, you know, there, there has to be a way of, you know, whatever, anything that we can conceptualize has to be able to be explained through more current ways of looking at, at psychology. Um, so redefining type, that's another aspect of, of what I'm trying to do in this. So type, you know, has a place in what I'm doing, but through a, a, a different perspective. Um, I'm seeing type as a, what I call a developmental pathway, i.e. the Myers-Briggs type, i.e. That, that it's intrinsically about the mind inherently trying to draw us towards a dominant function and then a, an auxiliary function and those being recognizable and that being a developmental pathway and if you look and it's always about seeing type in context of that development in terms of our history it's not a snapshot of now i hate that you know people look at it's there's not enough instruction about how to approach a type assessment and a lot of people will inherently go it's like it's asking the question what are you like what am i like what do you mean, like, what, now, this week, this month, this year, that's 10 years? Like, uh, or is it like, an INTJ might do, just automatically just look at their entire life and go, ding, that's it, okay, there we go, that's everything. Um, but it's all, people can have different perspectives, unless we ask the question, unless we give instructions about how to approach it, we're going to completely different perspectives and therefore different answers. And I think to, 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 to uncover actual, what someone's actual underlying type is, we have to look, 
especially at those times like teenage, late childhood, teenage years, early 20s, when the this, this sort of one-sidedness of type often is its at its strongest, where we're actually more of a type. I know, but, and we haven't had, you know, when we're working with people who are in their later life and who've been potentially through a much longer development process and balanced out a lot of these opposites and, and brought in new parts of their personality, um, if they see it as a snapshot of now and they go, what am I like now? And they read that and go, oh, is that my type? And well, it's, it's much less likely to be actually what their underlying type is because it could be, you've got to dig back through the development and see what was going on. Where were they? And see if that's the context with which, within which all of this other development has happened. The context of historical development is the type from my perspective. And I also see the cogn eight cognitive modes. I call I like the cognitive modes. That's the um, <laughs> so cognitive modes is, is, is uh, not a term that I created, but uh, Singer and Loomis use that term rather than cognitive processes or function attitudes. I quite like that, the idea of modes. I, the mind can take on different uh, modes. I see those as the fundamental reality. So actually, we've got um, the Myers-Briggs system, which is based on four dichotomies. And the four dichotomies view, it's just, you know, this is a bit controversial, but I see that as kind of an abstraction, a bit of a sidetrack, which is actually taking us further from the reality of what's going on. It can be useful in some ways. I think what's good is, hello, <laughs> what's good is that um, they add, it meant that they brought in the JP dichotomy. And some people don't like the JP dichotomy, but I think it's great because it correlates with one of the big five, which would otherwise be missing um, in terms, so it, it correlates with conscientiousness. So, which is, you know, quite, an, so it's got a lot of meaning. It, it needs to, we need to understand what having a, either extroverted thinking or extroverted feeling as one of our top two dom our dominant auxiliary functions actually means and how that relates to conscientiousness. And that's an important thing about type and personality. But I see the actual reality of what we experience in the moment, in our minds, as the, as the cognitive modes or cognitive processes. I don't think the what Gilman called the basic functions, I don't think we actually, we never actually experience the thinking function, the feeling function. In the moment when these things are actually happening and you actually look at it, that such distinctly different, like introverted feeling versus extroverted feeling, such distinctly different experiences when they're expressing themselves. And they've got completely different aims in the world that to conflate them by putting them into one thing and get to asking a question of whether people identify with that, I think it's quite tricky. And, and any description you make is, is, always, is never going to quite cover both of them off the, in, 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 and do them justice in the right way. So I, so I think that's one thing, you know, I'm trying to get away from the four dichotomies. I'm trying to get back to the eight cognitive modes. And I want to work with them directly, and I want to create instruments that actually measure them directly and don't abstract them into something else to then be deconstructed back to the thing that was originally reality. Anyway, so that's uh, the other thing I'll go about in a minute is other ideas that I've added about how I'm conceiving the eight functions or eight cognitive modes and um, the archetypes, how I'm grouping them together and, and that kind of thing as well. Um, so I mean, one, one area of, of psychology that's really important to understanding, I think, what type is and where it comes from is attention. Um, now, as I'm conceptualizing it here, I'm trying to draw a sort of a systems diagram of the mind and how I'm seeing these archetypes now, really, in, in, in the way I look at them. Uh, I'm seeing these, the archetypes as, as also attentional centers, like centers around which these um, subpersonalities gravitate that give them expression through attention and relation in a way that has this characteristic quality. They relate to the world in a particular way and each one of them can draw your attention and suck you into that archetypal perspective, that way of being. So, you know, somehow if this is a, a reasonable model of the mind, it's going to correlate with the brain somehow, but we don't know. No one knows how the brain and mind exactly correlate. Attempts to try and localise and work out how they actually relate have often just not gone very well. They, there's no simple way to, to, to work it out. There's no structure there. But we know that of course they do relate, and there's, there's, there's a lot of neuroscience and 
things which, which have general principles, but there's no overall bigger picture um, theory that, that has related them yet. Um, because actually, modern personality studies doesn't really look at the, 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 the structure of the mind. It looks at the structure of how we categorize behaviors. And behaviors are, what, are the end result of what the mind is doing. It's taking a different perspective. It's a different step. Whereas people like Jung were, were writing about the structure of the mind, of the psyche. We don't really talk about that anymore. We talk about this factor structure of behavior. It's a completely different perspective. But yes, there's more, of course there's mental processes underlying that behavior, but we don't really have a model on that. But this is, this is why this sort of thing is completely different to trait models. Um, it's about mental processes, not about behavior. Um, so what I'm thinking is here, we've got the conscious mind. We talked about consciousness having this sense of some kind of executive control or deliberateness or will or you know something that at least ownership if not direct intent there's something about something that we are doing that because it's conscious um, then you've got what's unconscious you've got the things that happen to you the wandering mind the attention that draws you grips you takes you in the flow the thing that you become I call that that's the human doing this is the human being this is us just being. We don't create that, it just happens, it expresses. Um, so if you've got two really fundamental centers of attention, I think the hero archetype, as Bibi conceived it, is you know, inherently related to the ego, to the conscious, willful mind. It feels like it has control, like it's in charge, like it's doing something. It's us. It can feel like, you know, the problem is when that becomes a sense of, that's all of who we are, that becomes a big problem. Whereas a lot of the time, you know, and it's been shown in, in research that like, humans tend to mind wander 30 to 50 percent of waking time, regardless of current activity. We all know this ourselves. We try to apply ourselves to work, and we're constantly drifting off. Our attention's going somewhere else. It's really hard to, really hard to work. It's a lot of energy required to apply your attention consciously, focused for a long period of time on one thing. Um, especially if it's something that our mind's not automatically gravitating us towards, more so with, the, with our preferences. Um, you know, this archetype here that is this, this, an attentional center for this being, attention, this unconscious self, is uh, the, the anima, the soul, or the animus spirit. It's different the gendered identities, but. That's another part of theory to go into that I'm not going to do today, but within this system, so we, we all live, I mean, I don't, you know, tell me if this does not resonate with your experience as a human being, but we're, we're constantly in this sort of pull between our conscious attention, what we want to focus on, what, we, what we're trying to deliberately do, versus where our mind is naturally trying to express and take us and, and focus on. You know, there's the two are always there, you know, we to do that for a while, but then there's only so long, we let go and, and, and then off we go again. Where has our mind gone to? And so we come back, oh, where was I? What did I just do? So those moments, now that's when we've got to catch ourselves and through mindfulness and trying to be more aware, there's a whole lot of this to discover. You know, we can be tricked into thinking that's what's going on most of the time. But that's only because we're not consciously aware of when we do drift off. And by being more aware of that, we can start to uncover the things, the places we're going, the things that we're doing, the experiences we're having, uh, while that is, it's happening. So look, what's the time does this meant to finish at? 12. 12. Okay, so we're just after 11. Good. I'm going to allow at least half an hour for this film. So, but also, attention research shows that we've, we've not only got what a lot of psychology research would call say, top down attention or bottom up attention. You know, these things are, are not just conceived in, in, in Jungian or type terms, these things are, are psychological uh, research um, based things about attention. There's also orienting attention, the fact that the idea that the environment can grab our attention. So we've got now we've got three different things vying for our attention. We've got the conscious mind trying to focus ourselves on doing something, our wandering mind trying to drag us off somewhere, and the attend and the environment also trying to pull us off and tend to certain things. It's a wonder we can get anything done at all. Um, now obviously if, if, if We've got preferences um, that within this, I, I believe that our type 
preferences sit within this, the, 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 the unconscious, wandering, automated attention. We don't choose our preferences, do we? Consciously, deliberately. We can't make ourselves be a type. And we know that people that try to do that and, that, and when that conflicts with our actual type, that leads them to all kinds of problems. Um, so if we're not choosing our type, if it's not deliberate, it is, ultimately the preferences are guided by unconscious attention. And, we've been, and if our preferences are trying to pull us a certain way, we can try and override that, but only for so long. The, the environment can try and drag us in a different direction as well. But depending on how strong, and I think this is something we don't measure in type, we don't measure strength of attentional bias, which I think is, is what the preference is. And we implicitly talk about it. People might go, oh, I'm a strong extrovert or a strong introvert. What do they actually mean by that? Because we don't measure that in, in MBTI. It's not something we should be saying. But in, in, inherently, we, we kind of get a sense of what that means. And it means that you know, my attention has a strong inherent bias towards pulling me towards subjective or, or object-facing processes. Um, you know, there's a very strong pull internally or externally, perhaps. That's what we mean by that. The, the, but it's about the attentional bias that's behind that preference. And, and how strong that bias is. Um, and, and therefore, well, if that's a very strong preference, i.e. attentional bias, well, it's going to take more effort consciously to, to, co to continuously monitor that and pull us in towards something else to overcome that, that pull of attention. And it's going to take a stronger, this, this idea of strong and weak situations, and if you come across that in, in psychology, but um, some situations are strong, i.e. They, they would exert a greater influence on, on what you're doing or what you're tending to. You know, like a crisis emergency situation, it's a strong situation, you cannot ignore it, you will attend to it. Whereas some, some things just kind of pass you by and you can just get on with whatever else you're focusing on. You make, does that make sense? So, you know, depending on how strong or, or this attentional bias is that's guiding our preferences, the environment may or may not conflict with that, depending on how strong the bias is versus how strong or weak the situation is. And that may or may not be able to overcome and, and, and focus us on something completely different. Does that make sense? It's like a way of looking at these forces of attention which are pulling us. And hopefully you can resonate with that in reality because, uh, you know, if you're not familiar with it, you know, just go and do, do, get, get the um, Headspace app on your phone and do some, do some mindfulness practices. And within a few minutes you'll go, oh yeah, my mind's wandering all over the damn place and there's all loads of things going on. Um, so another thing that I'm, I'm conceptualizing here is uh, how I see the functions. Um, the eight functions, the cognitive modes, cognitive processes, I really see them as something sp quite special, actually, and quite fundamental. Um, now this is, a, this is a hypothesis, the PPDR hypothesis. It stands for Psycho-Physical Dialectical Reality. I created that. But it, just, it describes what it is. It's described, so the idea of this is quite a simple concept, really, right? Now, remember my first degree was in chemistry, chemistry and, and physical chemistry and physics and that kind of thing. It's, it's a different area of science. Then I became a psychologist. Um, now, for like, probably at least 100 years, uh, the, you know, the idea of like physics is not, it couldn't stay as a material, materialistic science because it's, it's, it's about particles, it's about matter, but it's also about energy, it's about fields and waves, and that's, that forms a big part of what um, the nature of our world is about. And uh, the idea like, that, that actually quantum physics showed us that, especially when we looked at the small scale, and now we're realizing even at larger scales as well, there's a fine, there's, there's, there's a kind of a, a dialectic, there's, there's reality expresses itself as solid objects, particles, matter with boundaries, but it also expresses itself as energy, as a, as a, let's call it a, a duality, wave-particle duality. So actually what we see as the physical world isn't as physical and solid and, and as tangible as we think it is, it's also energy at the same time. And the boundaries that we think are like eggshells, solid, well, solid boundaries are, are actually energetic fields that actually are, are coming against each other. So there's this, this sense of like what I don't think psychology has ever really integrated this. The impact of what this means, reality, is energy and matter at the same time. It's both are true. 
But if you take that quite simply and go, well, okay, so let's, we're trying to understand the nature of the mind, or the nature of the brain. Well, the nature of the mind and brain are part of that reality. This, the nature, they're talking about the nature, well, the nature of the whole universe is, is this wave particles duality. Well, our mind and brain are within the universe. They're part of it. They're not separate to it. Therefore, they're also going to follow the same duality, or dialectic, as I call it. It's not just a duality. It's not one or the other. It's both. And does that make sense? It's just such a fundamental th idea that psychology cannot dispense with the re reality. has this nature. Therefore, psychology must have this nature, because psychology is part of reality. The mind is part of reality. The mind is part of the universe. It has to, it has to exist within psychology. And so, when I was looking at the, the functions, the function attitudes, I was thinking, well, you know, if the minds are dialective opposites, what are those? Well, sensing and thinking, they follow, and, and this is a set of principles, a set of rules as to how we en en engage with reality, uh, which I'll explain in a minute. Like sensing and thinking, they, 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 they model the world according to the material world of objects. Intuition and feeling and their, and their cognitive processes. They engage the reality and model it with a the, with the model that is closer to that of energy or waves and fields. Because in the world of waves and fields and energy, there, is no, there are no boundaries, there are no objects. In the sense, in the way that the material solid world does. Does that make sense? How, how did you come to that? That's a very interesting insight. Where did that... Introverted intuition. I understand that, but yeah. like, where did you play it out somewhere? Did you like test it a little? Or I thought a lot. You thought a lot. Yeah. You just sat. In, I know you just sit in here. You get these brilliant ideas. Yeah, I went that's for a few walks. Exciting. Yeah, I went for a few walks. Um, <laughs> it's not very well to Kant, I would say. <laughs> the idea of these Kantian categories shaping this very chaotic world that's amorphous and then putting it mm. into preconceived categories for us to experience, whereas. Well, the idea of this, 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 these two ways, this, this duality or dialectic of the world, it, it's, it's, it's essentially not a new idea. All the history of philosophy discusses it. That the ancient Chinese had yin and yang and concepts which basically are the same thing: matter and energy. But they were aware of it without having the sort of, without even knowing. I mean, it's, it's only been about some, I can't remember now, roughly 200-ish years since we were even aware of that that fields existed. And now that, that science has completely changed our whole world, because now we can use energetic fields and electricity and, and things like that to actually run the society that we have. But it wasn't, was it, historically, Faraday, Maxwell, Michael. these are the people. It's not that long ago they, 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 they actually came up with these, these, these ideas. Um, so I've got some basic symbols. I'm not going to go through this because in, in the courses that I do, you know, you can you can spend an entire afternoon or whatever just going through these and, and understanding. But the basic principles are, you know, operating, modelling the world by the rules of tangible material reality of particles with object with with boundaries. Um, this is going to take a bit more explanation, but you know, it's it's pretty obvious. Sensing and thinking, you know, like sensing, extrovert sensing, like it literally renders the boundaries. It just says something is there. It says there is an object. There is an object. Um, it, introvert thinking defines the object, defines the boundaries of the object. What does it contain? What does it not contain? And therefore, we can make decisions. You can make logical, categorical decisions and have values about things due to that. That's categorical logic, and I think, in an introverted sensing sense. So if you say, okay, what do I define as success? That are the things that success contains. This is the boundary. This is what contains. This is what it does not contain. This is what I am doing. This is what I'm doing contains. This is what it does not contain. Do the two overlap? Therefore, does what I'm doing equal success? And it's just, it's just a logical reality. Does it? Yes or no? Machine, computer says yes. Computer says no. Because if the definitions match, then yes, to a certain degree, you can say that is logically true. If they don't, it's logically false. There's a, there's a sense of categorical truth. Introverted sensing, now some people um, debate about whether this is something more about internal 
um, sensing in the moment versus extrovert sensing being external. I don't see the skin of the body as the boundary between extra introversion and extroversion. I see it as something more abstract than that. Uh, I am very much on board with the idea that introvert sensing is about specific concrete retention of information, facts, things you have sensed, and the, and the constant reference and the conservation of that, purely from like, talking to ISTJs and ISFJs and their internal experience and what it's like, but, and the fact that they're constantly going over things that have happened and, and, sh and sorting that information and, and categorizing it and recalling it and referring to it, and they notice when things are different and kind of comparing it. That just seems like, the, that seems to be what SI is from their experience. So I've just got that idea of like, as time expands, as it goes outwards, that object has different concrete ex um, realities. The object over time, like an onion. The onion is a different onion over time as it expands, like a tree. It's great, isn't it? It's a great metaphor. The tree is right, the tree trunk. You can see what that tree was like. It's like, it's, it's like an introverted sensing, it's like a history of the tree within the tree. Um, an extroverted thinking, well, that's the principle that objects act on objects as causality. An object can act, act on another object, there's an outcome, there's a tangible art, because objects have boundaries. Now, these are basic principles, but when you distill a basic, simple principle out of something, and you can look at, well, what are the actual behaviours that we see? That, that, and it can be such varied stuff, but when you, if you're looking for the essence, the theme, the, the, the central principle of what, what are they doing, what is the function? That's the level on which I think the functions are. They're that abstract. No wonder they can be hard. I'm going to answer questions at the end, because I don't want to get too much into any debate now. But the, the, the understanding the energetic world is slightly more difficult, because we don't, there's nothing, no object to grasp hold of. It's, it's implicit. And the best analogy I've got is, is um, one of the fields that we are most familiar with, which is gravity, which we live in all the time. Now, you can't see, smell, touch, taste gravity. It's there. But you know gravity, don't you? You know what gravity's like. You have a sense of what gravity is like, right? You know it implicitly. You could put it into words if you want, but you kind of go, okay, like, let's reflect on gravity. What's gravity like? Just give a sense of what gravity means to you. It might be a feeling. It might be a sense, a subject of something. It might be words. Like you might be saying something. Gravity is like this. It doesn't matter. But like something that gravity is like, that you experience and you know. And the gravity is a field. So think about how, without an object, without a boundary, you can say, okay, well, there's a point. When you look at a field, it's a relationship or points. And the quality of that relationship describes the field. We know it through the relation, we know fields through its relationship between the points. And that's how you can describe it. You can describe it mathematically as well. But if you look at the, if, like, the center of the Earth has a point, a center of gravity, and you have a center point, a ground of center of gravity. There's a relationship between those two things. And gravity is that relationship. And you can know about that relationship through moving yourself in relation to that Earth. And therefore, you can learn and know about. And over time, you, you develop an implicit picture, an intuitive knowing of what gravity is like. But it's not concrete. It's a sense of implicit knowing. And that's, that's what the world of, of, of when, you're, when you're operating in the world the, by the principles of intangible reality, energetic rea uh, waves and fields, it's a different set of principles. So if the first one I'm seeing is extroverted intuition, um, as being more about uh, comparing every different set of points, that and 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 that and, that and, that and getting a qualitative sense of what is going on. It's like, an extrovert intuitive mind seems to be going like this all the time. Like there's, there's so much energy involved in constantly getting an, an intuitive sense of what is going on in their world. And this, by, by comparing every possible set of points, it also creates infinite possibilities as well. Because through that point, you're seeing all the combinations. You're combining. Um, introvert intuition, I believe, as I talked about last year, it's kind of an implicit memory. You're storing all those associations of the world that you experience over your entire lifetime, and then that creates a, a web, a map of relationships, and you can dig into that, and you can go, where does it all point to? What does it all link to? And you go, ah, that's it. And then extrovert feeling, simple, or the principle of, of connection, of attraction. That's what people are looking for. They're looking for relational attraction, connections, positive relationship. Introvert feeling more about 
balance of harmony of what's going on, this in sense of the uh, are things in balance? Is there a sense of energetically? Are there all the even psychologically the forces are tight themselves? Are, is there is, is this is there some kind of harmony between them? And feeling that sense of when things are out of harmony has a gut wrenching kind of sense of discomfort versus a sense of bliss and harmony when it's all in alignment. Um, saying that there is some kind of energetic reality pattern behind reality and, and FI uh, is, is sensitive to that. It knows when things are, are just energetically right or wrong, they're in balance, out of balance, tense or out, out of tense. So what I'm going to do is, so now it's 25 past, I'm going to do a couple more slides and then I'm going to get into the video. So just to quickly, you might have seen this on my website, but I'm using emojis because emojis are like everywhere and everyone's phone has them and everybody's computer has them. Like modern archetypes. Modern archetypes, yeah. <laughs> now I've chosen these particular ones. I can't remember what emotions are actually meant to represent in emoji language. But um, this is two that I actually chose for the animate animus. That's the kind of, the, the one that resonates most with most people's experience of the inferior function. <laughs> Excruciatingly difficult and painful, but actually this is this, this kind of like a seductive winking of, um, emoji, which I also use, which has kind of got the other side to it. Um, but yeah, the tricks is obvious. <laughs> Uh, this eternal child has got this kind of innocence of, ah, oh, I wonder. Um, Posting personality is just a bit meh. That's the meh, the meh archetype. Uh, the hero is just like, I can do anything, I'm cool. Like, yeah, the demon daimon, but he's got a cheeky grin, isn't he? So he's got a daimonic side as well. You know, I can help you, but I'm going to screw you up. Um, you know, the, the, good, the good parent is, you know, it's just, it's very nice. Oh, I love you. You're a good parent, I'm happy. I'm nice. Whatever. <laughs> Critical parent. We all know that one, you know, mean, dark. But I've, I've kind of, so similarly to how um, transactional analysis has, has a PAX model, is it a pa um, PAX model, parent, adult, child. I mean, I think this directly relates to this. We've obviously got parent, adult, and child. Um, I see a lot, some people would see the opposing personality as the other adult, I see the demon diamond as the other adult. Um, because what John, John, when John writes about the opposing personality, he says it's sometimes called the negative anima. It relates to what Jungians would call the negative anima. He says it's got a slight, what you call a contrasexual side to it as well, as the anima animus does, which is why I call that spouse. So we've got parent, adult, child, spouse, PAX model. So that's another ad addition that I brought to this. We've even created these little chaps as well. If you're wondering what part of you looks like in a, in a more characterized way, you can kind of put it together and give it a t shirt. <laughs> Um, and also, you know, I get into mapping, and this is not a new thing either. This is a map between my, me and uh, my dad. Um, you know, this is a relationship in shadow, I guess you could call it. You know, whereby someone's great strength and, and central essence of who they are becomes a bit of a joke to the other one. Becomes mocked, um, made to look silly not really respected. Yeah, sadly, these things can shape my life. So, and there's all kinds of different mapping you can do. I do this with people in my courses and, and coaching. And um, it's just one of the most powerful things when you start to see how, when you one, when someone's using a function, that function gets kind of consolidated or called up. The other person to meet them and communicate with them has to kind of use that same function to meet them. But with it often comes the, the archetype. Uh, and if it's, in this case, a shadow archetype, um, it can be slight, somewhat destructive and, and not a positive relationship. It takes a lot of work to try and uh, get around this sort of thing because it's, because it's unconscious. It's just happening. It's expressing. It's happening from an age when you're so young that you don't even realize that it's happening. Um, so if you want to know more about the model in depth, I'm doing two workshops in uh, London and Brighton coming up. Um, we spent two days expanding on this. It will make actual uh, a lot more sense. Um, so we've got half an hour left. Perfect. Um, so I've seen this parts model as a reality because I've been studying it in my actual life with people that I really know and actual relationships. That's the only way to know it, as well as internally within your own experience. Because some of these parts, 
especially the introvert functions, you know a lot of what's happening through internal conflicts and internal processes. Um, some of it you know through your external relationships as well. So it's a long process and it took years to, for me to even get a sense of the eight parts which I was looking for from the model, what they're actually like in my life, how they actually play out, how they're, how they're actually affecting what happens. It's, it's there, it's so much in plain sight, but it's unconscious for one, so you kind of, when, you, when, you, when you're in it, you are it, it's carrying you away, and you can't even see it, you don't have that reflexive point. That's the other thing about conscious processes, is there's a re reflexivity, some kind of distance from the self, so you can absorb, observe yourself doing it, but when you're wrapped up in the unconscious, you've gone with it, and you don't have that, that viewpoint. So to develop that, trying to develop that viewpoint on what's going on all the time in your life is difficult. It takes time, it takes years. I'm trying to simplify this for people, so they don't have to take years to do it. Um, I think by looking at the essence of the functions, we can start to dig into the themes and start to really see what actually, wh where we can see the archetypes and coming out with particular functions. 